so excited to have Professor Dom Davies from the City University of London here with me, Professor Latinx. Welcome, Dom. Hi, Frederick. Thanks so much for having me. So, gosh, you know, you have had quite a journey and a quick journey, it seems, a <laughs> PhD there at Oxford and then a postdoc, but you were trained um, in literary studies. Um, but of course, now we know you for your work, your really important work in comics. Can you tell us how you kind of made that move and why comics studies? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a great question. Um, uh, well, basically, I was working on, uh, I did a PhD basically in the representation of the built environment in colonial writing. So I've always been interested in histories of empire, being from Britain, you know, these things are quite pressing. And as we've seen over the, certainly in the last couple of months with Black Lives Matter movements and its incarnations here in the UK, um, these questions are suddenly very pertinent again. So I've always been a kind of post-colonial studies um, interested in histories of empire and, and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and so I wrote a, back, wrote a book about uh, how literature dealt with the built environment in that way and was doing quite a lot of work around that. Um, and I was not a huge comics reader. I mean, I, you know, I read like uh, the Beano and the Dandy are kind of, you know, our childhood favorites, um, but was not a huge uh, comics or graphic novel uh, reader. Um, but I had a friend who was during my PhD and it was, uh, reading graphic novels with a perfect antidote to the kind of slog of uh, of PhD uh, PhD life, and it was as I was reading Joe Sacco's Palestine, and I've just put the splash page, which I'm sure you know many viewers will be familiar with. It's kind of the central. If you let the Palestine, the book edition of Palestine fall open, it's the you know the sort of central page, and it depicts Jabali, a refugee camp, and I'd been you know doing all this work around literature and how literary writing, you know, can help us um, resist uh, colonialism or um, can help us make sense of the built environment or undeveloped cities or that kind of stuff. Uh, and suddenly here staring me in the face was this incredible comics page that seemed to do it much better than any of the, the literary writing uh, I'd been doing. And so really, you know, that was the beginning and that was I think that was in 2013 so like you say you know not that long ago uh, but I had been reading uh, with much you know excitement and enthusiasm with a lot of catching up to do. Uh, mm. Well it's really uh, fan, uh, exciting the work that you've been carving out this space um, urban comics the built environment built landscapes to me as well is extremely exciting I think it's also an area that you know, you're pioneering, you're kind of pushing forward, and um, we really need to pay attention to the kind of built landscapes and comics. But tell us um, about your work here and how, you know, this sort of the kind of thesis or one of the arguments about it being able to repair, um, give us insight into global cities um, in a more progressive, positive way, possibly. Yeah, absolutely. So this was a kind of um, I think the, the book took me about four years um, to, to, to research and write and, and two, at least two of those years were I wasn't really doing anything else. So again, you know, it was quite, a, quite an intense and focused period. But I, in addition to like reading widely uh, and uh, engaging with comic studies, uh, and one of the reasons you know, I stayed in comic studies is because uh, it was so warm, I was so warmly welcomed and, and found such a great uh, community here in the UK and, uh, and globally. Um, and um, yeah, I, you know, I wanted to bring the skills that I had gained from my PhD about representations of infrastructure and uh, urban space and urban landscapes. And I you know, wanted to try and uh, advance some of that, uh, some of that ground in, in, in comic studies. Um, and, uh, you know, I didn't, uh, in, in approaching that, I didn't lose, you know, I retained my interest in kind of social justice movements um, and, you know, in a, in a kind of, I guess we might call it a kind of decolonized curricula, I suppose is, is one of the words that goes around a lot now, but, but trying to basically um, to sort of capture and amplify artists working in the global south as well as, uh, you know, in, in the kind of uh, the more hegemonic geography of, mm. of Anglo-America. So, I mean, it, mm -hmm. sorry, yeah. go 
No, I was uh, um, going to say um, maybe um, you can kind of walk us through a little bit of the ways that you might read some of these uh, pages. Absolutely. So it all happened quite um, intuitively um, and I, you know, followed my nose and I had a very generous research budget from the British Academy, which allowed me to travel a lot, which was uh, absolutely <laughs> essential. Um, uh, so I'm very grateful to them. Uh, and um, I eventually decided on five cities, five city case studies, basically. So in the book, there's um, a sort of introduction where I outline the methodology, but then there's uh, more in-depth five uh, five cities, and the five cities I choose are, you know, broadly speaking, southern cities. Um, so they are Cairo, uh, Cape Town, uh, New Orleans. So not necessarily in the global south, but um, uh, certain associated with a certain kind of uh, with the southern politics, if you like, or southern culture, um, uh, and Delhi and Beirut. Uh, and uh, I looked at comics from across, what I basically found was the more research I did into the comic scenes going on in those cities and the more artists I spoke to, the more I realized how so many of them were, were interested in um, uh, the city and representing their cities and in, and in unsettling or troubling a way in which their city was often viewed by outsiders. So I think like if we took, take these from here, I just have a few, uh, few panels. Um, from artists both resident in those cities and also artists who were drawing about those cities. So um, we've got here on the left, the opening page of Magdi El Shafi's uh, uh, Metro, a story of Cairo, which is uh, Egypt's first uh, graphic novel. Um, and really, you know, you can see how uh, from the outset, there's this kind of emphasis on eyes, which for, for all comics readers will know that you know, eyes tend to get a lot of emphasis and comics tend to be quite interested in calling our attention to the way in which we, we're looking at Paige and what we're seeing and what the politics of seeing might be. And you see a similar thing at work in uh, The Man Who Built Beirut on the bottom right hand corner. And what was interesting to me is that the way these, the way that we look at cities was very much uh, bound up with the way in which, um, you know, has implications on their on their development, I suppose. And comics were really great at exposing this. Um, and the best, for me, one of the, the sort of a great example of this is, uh, is The Fairest Cape here by a Cape Tonian uh, artist. Um, uh, and you can see that he's drawn a kind of, uh, the, the first panel, The Fairest Cape uh, is a sort of, um, uh, it's like a, it's, you know, it's performing the visual rhetoric of a, of a postcard. Uh, so, you know, for those of you, if you type in Cape Town into Google, you'll get all these images of this beautiful coastline. Um, and what those images of Cape Town as a you know, tourist enclave, a global city, uh, what they don't show you is you know, the deep inequalities in Cape Town, in particular, that in, exist in the townships behind the iconic Table Mountain. And so, uh, what, uh, his name is Daniel Duplessis, by the way, who, who, who does this, uh, this, this short comic. Uh, on risograph actually uh, and you can see how he, he he gives us that first global city image and then in the bottom three panels if, uh, if viewers look closely they'll see um, that he actually moves into the different uneven uh, unevenly developed spaces so he goes in the first bottom panel to Kalicha and he shows you know these kind of um, workers basically uh, people you know very poor infrastructure sort of reminding us a bit of that um, picture of of the refugee camp in, in Josaka's Palestine. And then he also, you know, uh, shows the, you know, the sort of uh, the richer enclaves, the richer suburbs um, with their, uh, you know, uh, where there's the most expensive real estate. Um, and there's this sort of very glum looking woman. And the, you know, the implication I think is, the sort of subtle implication is that, you know, segregation is not good for anyone really. <laughs> um, and that this, this level of inequality that is mapped spatially on the city. Um, uh, is something that you know can, needs to be critiqued and, and resisted. Um, and viewers may recognise that bottom image, which is from Josh Neufeld's uh, incredible graphic novel, uh, or first a web comic and then a graphic novel, AD New Orleans After the Deluge, about Katrina. And it's also yes, I'm sorry you have it. Uh, sorry about that. Let me no, no. Um, which again, when you when you start reading uh, comics about Katrina. Um, with these other issues in mind, you know, you find that actually uh, 
um, uh, Josh, Josh was showing up kind of the ways in which urban inequality, pre-existing urban inequality and segregation sort of, you know, uh, created uneven impacts on, on different de demographics uh, in the aftermath of that uh, disaster. So, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. So, yeah, what was, what's the kind of, um, <laughs> I see a lot of um, critique in and through the ways that built spaces are being reconstructed. Um, are there also ways that that you find um, a kind of utopic rebuilding that's being offered by some of these comic book creators or others? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, in Cape Town in particular, actually, but in other places too, there's this kind of um, speculative edge, you know, where you get a vision of Cape Town that is uh, that is recognizably Cape Town. You know, we can see it's got the same geography and we know that, you know, the artist is Cape Townian and uh, some of the issues that come up are uh, associated with the place, but it's set in a kind of speculative future. So it combines with the kinds of, um, yeah, the kind of utopian politics that we see in some, in some sci-fi. Mm -hmm. um, but I would also add one other thing that I found really interesting and I tried to highlight um, in the book, was the way in which comics not only, um, you know, helped us to see and understand uh, cities and how they might be violent or how they could be made less violent, um, but also how they brought people together through the act of making them. And that's something that I've always, I'm sure we'll talk about it a bit more. So I've always been interested in is um, the, the community gelling, you know, the way that it brings, you know, if you're sitting, running a comics workshop, brings different people uh, together and gives them, becomes a real point of kind of to, to share ideas. And it was really interesting to me, so many artists uh, from Cairo to Cape Town, to New Orleans, uh, to Beirut and Delhi, in, in all, of, all of those cases, um, many of the comics uh, had come out of uh, amazing kind of social networks within the city between people, um, uh, you know, where they were working together uh, uh, to create uh, to create an industry, really, to create a market and to create an industry uh, and to find readerships. Um, but also in, in, in so doing that, you know, they were creating shared spaces that transcended the segregation that they were critiquing in the comics. So I really liked uh, and, and wanted to sort of emphasize the way that comics were doing, were doing that. Yeah, I love that. It's so important to be reminded of that, um, those kind of other built spaces. Um, so speaking of violence, um, tell us about this documenting trauma, um, comics and trauma. It's a, I know that Mouse has been talked a lot about. We have MetaMouse, um, um, you know, um, others that seem to be kind of favorites. But tell us about your this project and um, why trauma and comics. Yeah. So, as I was reading, kind of um, very widely, uh, and comics and graphic novels and comic studies, um, you know, it seems to me perhaps quite rightly under the influence of Mouse, partly. Um, uh, and certainly, you know, that kind of altern alternative comic scene, which, which Mouse came out of, um, that there was a real preoccupation with trauma uh, among kind of, uh, that comics seem to be drawn to, to, to trauma as, um, uh, as a kind of key uh, uh, theme and idea. Uh, and, you know, people who've read Hilary Chute's Graphic Women or indeed uh, Disaster Drawn, but there are other, many other fantastic studies uh, will know how, how central trauma has been to the history of, uh, of the sorts of stories comics try to tell. And so I had, uh, as during that time when I was writing urban comics, um, uh, I got some funding uh, to run a big conference um, in, uh, in Oxford. Uh, and I really wanted to do that because I, um, you know, Oxford's a slightly old, slightly, um, I'm not gonna say snobbish, but I'm gonna say, you know, uh, slightly uh, has a, a sense of itself that it would not normally associate with you know it, it patrols the boundaries between high and low culture quite um quite carefully uh, and so i really wanted given that i'd been able to get this postdoctoral research uh position at oxford i really wanted to 
to host a comics conference and to set up a, a regular comic, comics venue, a venue for discussion about comics at Oxford. Um, uh, and, you know, with the help of several other people um, in Oxford was able to do that. And the main event, I suppose, of that before I moved on, I should say that the, the, the seminar is still running at Oxford, uh, which is great. And I, mm. I, I'm really pleased uh, and I'm certainly not responsible for that. Um, but one of the, the main sort of events that uh, we did while I was there was this, uh, this event about the relationship between documentary form and, and trauma uh, and comics. Um, so if we just skip over to the next slide. Mm. Um, yeah, you can see here, this is the call for papers that I did. Uh, the original title, I think, was yeah, Documenting Trauma Comics and the Politics of Memory. Uh, so obviously memory is obviously tied, cl closely, mm -hmm. uh, closely tied to this. Um, um, Hilary Chu kindly came to give the keynote. Uh, and, and Nicola and, was there, it seemed. Yeah. And Nicola was there, yeah, absolutely. Nicola Streeton and a few other really uh, mm. incredible people. Uh, and I was just really pleased. Um, you know, we got such a great response. Uh, we had more than 60 people um, uh, gathering in Oxford to talk about, uh, you know, comic studies in its latest incarnation. And it was, it was really, yeah, it was really, it was a really terrific event. And some of the photos, I think, uh, uh, yeah, there's Nicola giving her keynote and Candida Rifkind, who uh, I'm currently doing some work with and uh, in another seminar mm -hmm. room, and us celebrating um, uh, after the end of a very, very uh, long day. Um, Fantastic. I, I, um, I, I just love that you guys did this at the kind of, I don't know, um, the center of kind of like, you know, empire Western civilization. You have like comic studies recolonizing, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, saw, I really saw it like that. It's, you know, slightly subversive and unsettling and, uh, and getting people to recognize that uh, this subculture needs to be taken seriously by, you know, by cultural critics, um, yeah. uh, literary yeah. critics too. Um, yeah, and it was such it was such a great day. Um, and one of the things that we did, uh, yeah, we, we can go forward. Uh, um, and uh, one of the things that we did alongside that, I mentioned earlier, I liked the kind of the community mm -hmm. vibe or the community uh, uh, potential of comics in practice. So um, some colleagues at a place called Oxford Writers House, uh, which is a kind of independent organization of the university, uh, had been running kind of art and writing workshops. Uh, and because we had all these people coming uh, to Oxford, we just, the day before we ran a kind of community creation, uh, uh, sorry, a comics creation workshop, where we invited people who were speaking at the conference, but also people, members of the public, um, uh, to come in and to uh, really, you know, uh, to, to try different kind of uh, drawing techniques, artistic techniques, um, and to um, uh, to express their own relationship with what the the kind of the, the phrase documenting trauma meant meant to them, mm -hmm. um, uh, and you know in the end we had some really terrific from that day we had some really terrific um, uh, sort of short kind of one page some slightly longer comics and we compiled them into a graphic anthology and we have a few uh, taster uh, yeah. Just a few, I mean, these are just a few brief examples mm. of the different uh, styles people use, some much more conventional, some kind of super abstract, some using collage. Um, wow. Yeah, it was really terrific. So I really like that. And um, yeah, we called it Inkfish, the idea that squirting ink all over the page. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we created a, a sort of zine, uh, if you like, out of that and circulated that for free around uh, Oxford you know, in cafes and, and things like that. So it was really nice to have this kind of, it wasn't just, although we were in the university, we were not just in the university. We were also trying to, to reach out. And I really, you know, I think uh, in a way that if you went to a literary conference, a literary critical conference, you, you, I mean, you do have writers there, but you don't have people trying out writing very often. Um, and right. I love that comics has always integrated that practical element and always wanted people to have a go. Yeah, it um the it erases the line, the town gown line as they call it. Absolutely. One, the table of contents is pretty remarkable <laughs> here. Yeah. Yeah. So I I appreciate this is not the most uh, beautiful slide. 
Um, and I won't, uh, I won't go into detail here, but I just wanted to give viewers um, a sense of the scope of the, uh, the chapters that are now included in that book. And so that book grew directly out of that um, conference. And you yeah. can see Nic Nicola Street and very kindly did mm. a, a comic um, uh, for, for this collection. And she even draws herself in the comic in the same dress that she wore on the day that she gave her keynote. So there's a lovely kind of uh, mm. uh, references back. But, um, you know, broadly speaking, I gave a sort of, I wrote a quite long introduction where I tried to sort of historicize the relationship between trauma and comics. And to say that the way, my main argument was really that the way we've thought of trauma actually owes quite a lot to comics. So often people say, oh, comics are drawn to trauma because the comics form bears a lot, uh, a lot of resemblance to the shape of trauma. And I said, well, actually, I think, you know, comics form has actually helped people, so many theorists to theorize trauma that actually, you know, there's a chicken and egg situation here, uh, but I kind of wanted to put comics back on more in the center of the way in which trauma discourse had, had, had developed and evolved. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, so instead of it just being considered a kind of response to but rather a kind of active shaper of, yeah. No, that's really remarkable. Um, you know, Dom, tell us, uh, one of the things that I, I love about your work, I mean, there are many things um, where we have um, kind of cross interests, very deep interests, but this interest in nonfiction comics, I think is really powerful, and especially as located in spaces like the US-Mexico borderlands, can you talk a little bit about that work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, you know, perhaps given that Sacco was my gateway drug, it's not that much of a surprise that I have a real interest in, in non-fiction comics. Um, but then also, you know, my wider background and kind of uh, social justice issues and human rights issues, um, I've been really, given that I was already interested in those themes and, um, you know, had done a PhD relating to them, broadly speaking, I was really kind of amazed to see um, how comics had really become, you know, very recently, really in the last 10 years or so, uh, had exploded from beyond Sacco, right, into, uh, you know, into, into such an incredible uh, and diverse and continually evolving body of work. and. Um, you know, it's one thing just to, to really keep track of it. And yeah, nonfiction comics, comics journalism. Um, and one, 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 I guess, uh, one theme that emerges is this real interest uh, of comics. And it concerns, you know, I'm very interested in uh, just more generally and in my current research about the relationship between comics and borders uh geopolitical borders such as the us mexico border and also refugees and there does seem to be some strange uh connection between the two and i mean um you know after all mouse is a uh, a refugee story uh margin satrapi's persepolis is also a refugee story uh many of sacco's comics are refugee stories so i guess what sometimes gets called a canon, I suppose, of graphic novels, uh, is, does seem to have uh, an interesting preoccupation with refugees. But as we get beyond that, it can't just be a kind of marketing thing um, because there is such, there's a, comics are used to visualize places and spaces that, um, that are not usually seen. I think, um, you know, keep things quite simple. I think that's the main uh, place. And they're very interested in digging down in a kind of archaeology, I suppose, almost like a kind of forensics um, uh, of recovering stories that get lost, uh, particularly in our own era of kind of super fast uh, mainstream media where we're so used to clicking and scrolling and reading text and image side by side. Um, and there's some great work on, 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 on web comics by, by other critics. Um, but in this, uh, in this article that is uh, that's referred to here, um, I talked about the way in which uh, uh, these two comics in particular had been drawn to uh, uh, the city of Juarez, uh, which borders El Paso on the US-Mexico border, and had been interested in, particularly in 
um, recovering the stories of um, people who've been subject to you know mass to mass violence there really you know unbeknownst to uh, an outside world or well, not unbeknownst but certainly not you know certainly not as a headline uh, certainly not here in Britain and I think probably not not that much so in the US and so I really used the opportunity of these two incredible comics to, exp to, to follow further down on that what what is it about um, the relationship between text and image in particular that is so unique to comics that makes them drawn to these kind of spaces um, uh, and really tried to yeah to, to sort of just to begin to uh, just to begin to un unpack that a little bit so important the way comics um, allow us to take pause right and of course, take pause in these spaces that don't um, have get the attention or the voices that you know you sort of so kind of beautifully articulate in your work. Um, yeah, uh, refugee comics, um, borders, geopolitics. Um, yeah, tell us a little bit more about this. So yeah, this is a kind of this has been a running thread. Uh, that I kind of got interested in as I was working on urban comics, partly because of just the abundance of uh, of what refugee comics, migrant comics. Um, uh, it's a, you know, it's a, it's becoming a kind of almost a sort of sub uh, sub genre of its, if not a genre of its own. Uh, um, and um, these are just the titles of a few. Uh, uh, articles that I've done with including some work with a, an organization called refugee hosts. Um, and they're really great. I recommend uh, viewers checking out the website. If you Google refugee hosts, you'll find it. Uh, I've written a couple of pieces on there and they're very interested in using different media. They're aware that, you know, photographing refugees in distress is embedded in a very difficult and fraught um, ethics, uh, if not politics. Um, and so, um, refugee hosts have been interested in uh, using different media. Uh, to capture those stories uh, of, of of the border, uh, and I my, in my work with them, I kind of um, have introduced graphic narratives into their into their lexicon. Um, but this is part of a much uh, wider interest of mine and of and of several other uh, great critics. Um, uh, and yeah, um, uh, some of these articles are free to read online. Um, but I guess again, you know, I was kind of. Uh, this is one of my favorite pages uh, from a, produced by an organization called uh, Positive Negatives. Again, strongly recommend their website. Um, again, if you Google Positive Negatives comics, you'll, you'll find them. This is from a series, a trilogy of comics they did called The Perilous Journey, which told the stories of three Syrian refugees uh, traveling from Syria to Europe in, in 2015. Uh, and it came out then and, and it's hard to remember now because so much has happened mm. since it's been an eventful few years but at the time uh you know which was when i was just getting into comics 2015 was um crisis the so-called refugee crisis uh, in, mm -hmm. in europe uh, yeah. and refugees were hyper visible uh, and it, it, it got another resurgence again when trump came in and did his uh refugee ban if you remember that in uh, mm. beginning of 2016 and um I was 2017, sorry. Uh, and so comics really started almost as a kind of resistance to this mainstream discourse, um, started picking up these stories more and more um, and becoming, so many are available um, online as web comics. This, you know, it's not just graphic novels anymore. Um, it's also a kind of uh, serialized comics. Um, mm. and, and for me, this page is, is especially like really captures it because it really captures the kind of uh, almost the kind of motion sickness, uh, the kind of affective uh, uh, feeling of what of uh, of the way that the, the experience of migration and the disloc the dislocation of displacement can be conveyed to us as readers through the spatial layout of the page. Um, and so, yeah. for example, I talk about this in that article, braided geographies. You know, we're used to um we know as, as comics critics we're familiar with the term braiding um Thierry Grunstein's idea that you know every every panel is in relationship with another panel um and so I use this term braided geographies to show how refugee comics connect up different spaces for us and we're told that you know 
uh, a nation state is one place with no relationship to another place and these places are strictly segregated um, and comics because they have these kind of this, this, this braiding they're able to juxtapose places and um, and show us that actually you know for migrants but also for us too there are far more spaces far more complex it's mm. uh, connected up in really interesting and myriad ways beautiful thank you for sharing that um, tremendous insight tell us how you bring some of this into your classroom spaces yeah so i, I teach um so i'm a, you know i am a lecturer in english still <laughs> by title um so i teach on the ba in english and the ma in english at city university um and i uh i sneak a few uh comics and graphic novels into my undergraduates so uh for my undergraduates uh they all get uh in first and third year when i teach them they they get to read comics and graphic novels as part of their literary course literature course and i think that's really you know essential i don't think um to say to have an undergraduate in literature without having read any graphic novels seems to me uh not not right anymore you know i think we're at a stage now where it's such an important it's like it's like having uh, an undergraduate in literature without having uh, read any romantic poetry or something like that you know it's almost it's a, it's a really important uh, section of literature but my real uh, baby i suppose is a module that i teach on uh, on the ma where i get to teach only uh, comics and I teach only non-fiction comics of the kinds we've been talking about and I teach one specific particularly interested in conflict and refugees um, and so it's called text and image with the subtitle of comics and conflict um, and we I get students to read uh, uh, those kind of uh, some kind of key we start with mouse and Sacco but we go into some of the kind of refugee comics I've been talking about later in the course and we read it alongside kind of key theories of visual culture. And I really get them thinking about how, um, uh, how comics can help us to think critically about uh, all kinds of uh, issues, in including the way you know, in which refugees are represented in the media, the way in which we think of ourselves as national citizens, as global citizens, all these kinds of ethical and political issues. And uh, the, the students respond really well. Um, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to teach. I bet, yeah. When well, next time I'm in London, I'll sign up. Um, <laughs> so, so um, as we kind of begin to kind of roll uh, down, wrap up, um, tell us a little bit about your new projects, and then I want to segue into kind of like the grand vitality of comics questions. Uh, so, yeah, what's next for you, Dom? Um, so, two very projects still in their early stage. Um, but generally kind of, uh, you know, ticking over. First, Graphic Refuge, that's how it, that's what we're calling it at the moment with my colleague, uh, Professor Candida Rifkind at um, uh, University of Winnipeg. And we're working on a book about um, refugee comics uh, uh, and the way in which comics, you know, uh, as I've been talking about really, that really brings some of this, uh, some of this work into, into one place. Um, so keep an eye out for that, I hope, you know, Maybe next year, maybe maybe the year after that, we'll we'll be able to to get that out. Uh, and then um, I recently uh, wrote an article with a colleague in the social sciences uh, who works on climate change and issues of water and um, the Anthropocene, um, the way in which humans are shaping uh, the environment. Um, and we looked at how uh, graphic novels can help us come to terms with that crisis. Uh, and the article's available uh, online. It has a slightly different title to that. It's called uh, Apocalypse Yesterday, Post-Humanism uh, and Comics in the Anthropocene. Um, but we're working together on a project about, uh, uh, that I hope will eventually be a, a book uh, about that. Wow, so exciting. And um, don't forget my world comics and graphic nonfiction series at the University of Texas Press. Um, right, yes. <laughs> uh, um, so, Gosh, you know, I know you talked about, you know, the usual things, comics when you were a kid, um, the kind of usual uh, Beano, you know, et cetera, and then later really becoming much more interested in college, especially with the nonfiction space of comics. But where are you seeing the kind of life force of comics today? Hmm. I mean, I guess, you know, I, um, 
my uh, my perspective on comics uh, is uh, clearly quite uh, quite not niche, but uh, limited to a you know to a certain set of interests. Um, so I, that for me is where the vitality is. But I'm aware that uh, this is you know this is a tiny bit of a huge uh, and incredibly exciting field. And I think I don't know I you know I wouldn't want to. Uh, these would only be speculations, but I, I guess, um, I guess I think we still have to see, see more from web comics. I think um, uh, it's interesting how they've, they've sort of, they sort of took off and then they, they didn't. And um, uh, I, I think there's still more potential to be, to be unpacked there. And I think perhaps we're just there's something about the form of the scroll down web page or the kind of motion. I don't know what your comment, uh, I know people have very strong opinions on motion comics. I'm not sure how I feel about them. Um, but I think, you know, there's a lot more uh, as the kind of digital platforms develop, um, there's a lot more uh, to, be, to, be, to, to look out for around there. I'll be interested to see uh, how that works. Um, yeah, I think you're right. I think that could be a really vital new space. Um, or of it's it's been a space, but the technology is maybe catching up with the creativity in ways that will free uh, the creative expression instead of it be in the past there it seems that there might have been the technology as a kind of um, accessory or a kind of gadget or something, um, especially though right with covid nineteen my goodness, um, you know uh, getting the print copies of things has become much more difficult. So maybe this is the time for web comics. Yeah, yeah. But that's one hypothesis. Yeah, no, really exciting. Um, Dom, um, um, I don't know if we have this slide here, but um, I just wanna say thank you, Dom. Your um, work is really uh, phenomenal. It's opening our eyes to the importance of kind of borderland spaces, refugee comics, nonfiction comics, and your sensitivity, your nuance, um, as well as your kind of global purview is really remarkable. So thank you. Thank you, Dom. Oh, that's, that's very kind of you to say, thank, Frederick. Thank you so much for having me on here. It's, um, it's really great to have the opportunity. Mm -hmm.